Bass are popular because they're accessible almost everywhere and fun to chase. In our first season, we went through the very basics of getting started. In this video, we'll take fly fishing for bass to the next level. We'll show you how to be successful catching largemouth and smallmouth bass in all seasons in both rivers and lakes. We'll demonstrate different fly lines, leaders, flies, and techniques to catch bass throughout the season. We're also gonna help you find them based on the season, which is perhaps the most important part of bass fishing. It's gonna be a great journey of discovery, education, and fun. <laughs> All right, we'll get him back in the water. Oh, yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Destination Ontario, Algoma Country, Main Office of Tourism, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. You know, bass are fun no matter where you catch them and no matter how big they are. And they can be found almost all around North America. We're gonna explore the seasons of bass because bass fishing is different depending on the time of year and the time of day and what the bass are doing. First, let's look at spring. Bass spawn in spring. When water temperatures get to be about 58 degrees, bass move into the shallows to stage prior to spawning. Then they typically spawn between 60 and 70 degrees. Bass behave differently before and after the spawn. Both are great opportunities, but you have to check your regulations because in some states and provinces, there's a closed season to protect spawning bass. Some areas allow you to fish for bass during spawning season on a catch and release basis. Pre-spawn usually happens between 48 and 55 degrees. As lake or river waters warm up, both smallmouth and largemouth bass begin to move from their deep winter haunts to search for food in preparation for spawning. In this animation, you can see how bass travel from deep water to shallow water areas to hunt for prey. The type of structure they go to will vary depending on the water types and prey availability. They're usually quite aggressive, depending on water temperature, and will spread out in small hunting packs, constantly moving and searching for prey. This corresponds with the emergence of crayfish from hibernation which is why crayfish patterns are so effective in spring. Baitfish are also moving into the shallows in search of warmer water. Bass are trying to get nourishment in preparation for spawning, so they feed eagerly. On sunny days, when the shallow water warms quickly, bass will be found in the shallows hunting for crayfish and baitfish. Look for them in areas of down timber, rocky shorelines, and around rocky islands. Now, I've never done any smallmouth fishing this early on purpose anyways, but we're here to try to see if we can catch some of these pre-spawn smallmouths. Here we are in Maine in May before spawning season. We looked for smallmouth in the shallows on this river and we found this nice one. There's one way back in the shallow water, but low and slow is sure the, is sure the secret here with these early season smallmouths. By using plenty of pauses in our strips, we allowed the fly to settle on the bottom and then dart upward, which keeps the fly moving slower and keeps it closer to the bottom where bass are found at this time of year. 
Thank you, buddy. Let's see if there's another one back in there. Oh, there's another one. These fish are, are just in the just in the current, but right in the slower part of the current. When the water gets between 55 and 70 degrees, bass are staging for spawning, building nests, and actually spawning. It's important to note that not all bass spawn at once. At any given time, when the water's in the 60s, some bass may be getting ready to spawn, others will be spawning, and some will already have finished spawning. So in the early season, there aren't many insects around. So the fish are gonna be eating mostly bait fish and crayfish. The bait fish are starting to get active, the crayfish are starting to get active. So you wanna have flies that kind of match bait fish and crayfish. So I've got some, some bait fish imitations of various sizes and colors here. And then I've got some different crayfish imitations and a big nymph. Uh, there are some, there are, there may be a few mayflies hatching pretty soon, so we're gonna try a, a big nymph. So it's early season and we just caught a bass and it spit up a bunch of little bait fish. Now I'm not that bright, but I don't have to be a hit over the head to tell me that it's probably a good idea to put on a bait fish imitation. So I've got this game changer, which is eh, quite a bit bigger than that bait, but I know they're eating bait fish. They're probably not gonna be selective. So I'm gonna fish this bait fish imitation and see if we can interest the bass. If you want to avoid fishing for actively spawning fish, don't fish directly over their nests. Some people don't think it's ethical. The nests are easy to spot. Your best bet is to look for cruising fish, which are usually pre-spawn or post-spawn fish. If you want to target post-spawn fish, which are usually females and a little bit bigger, they'll be found in deeper water, six to 10 feet deep beyond the beds. Males guard the nest, so they may still be on the nest when the females are deeper. The males will stay on the nest up to four weeks, guarding the young from predators. On the crayfish. Well, you've been fishing bait fish patterns and poppers all day and really haven't tried a crayfish, so you can tell when they think they're crayfish because they always take them deep because um, they want to crush them. They want to get them right into their throat. All right, buddy. Water's warming up, you can tell. They're frisky today. This fly I'm using is, uh, is a, a double header. Is a, uh, is a fly I tied for saltwater fishing for striped bass. It's a crab imitation. Got some claws and some rabbit fur, and that's about it. As water temperatures warm and bass complete their spawning, they're exceptionally aggressive and hungry. This is the time to begin trying surface flies like hair bugs. Often, this is the best bass fishing of the year. What a sip. Did you see it. that? If you're not catching bass at this time of year, you need to move because they're going to be feeding somewhere. So for a lot of bass fisheries, you probably only need one fly line. And the go-to line, for the most part, is an intermediate line. An intermediate line is a slow sinking line and you can fish shallow with it, just fish with an unweighted fly. And you can also fish deep with it. If you put a weighted fly on, it'll pull the intermediate weight line down and you can fish it deep. So that's really a go-to line. But if you're gonna be fishing a big lake like this, you're probably gonna want two or maybe three fly lines. I never go without a floating line because I love fishing poppers for bass. If there's any opportunity at all, I'm gonna fish a popper. So you need a floating line for that. And then if you're in a big lake, particularly if it's midsummer and you suspect the bass are suspended deep, you're probably also gonna want a full sinking line or a depth charge type line. So um, three lines are great. Probably two is a good idea on large lakes. If the fish are very shallow, under four feet deep, you'll usually be able to spot them if the water's clear enough, and a floating line is about all you'll need. Weighted flies are useful here too, and you don't need to worry about the splash a weighted fly makes because the plop of a weighted fly may actually attract a hungry bass.
If you suspect the bass are in deeper water, or if you can't see bass on the spawning beds, they'll likely be in four to 10 feet of water close to the spawning beds. You need to get deeper in the water column and will need to keep your fly in this deeper water throughout your retrieve. So a sink tip or intermediate line is a better choice. So I'm using an intermediate line and a weighted fly so that I can get deep if I need to. Yet with that intermediate slow sinking line, if I wanna go in and fish the shallows, I still am not hanging bottom every time. And what you wanna do is make sure that you keep your rod tip low to the water. We got a little bit of wind today, and if you keep your rod tip low to the water, you're gonna keep that fly totally in control. You're not gonna have a lot of slack blowing around in the wind, and you're also gonna be able to see and feel those strikes a lot better. For deeper water, let the line and fly sink using the countdown method as intermediate lines sink at about one and a half to two inches per second. Oh, wow, beautiful. When using an intermediate line in deeper water, Make sure you keep your rod tip low and your line tight to the fly, as bass will often take the fly on the initial drop. Watch for the line to tighten or twitch as it sinks. In shallower water, with an intermediate line, just begin your retrieve quicker so the fly fishes at an effective depth and prevents snagging on the bottom. In this early season smallmouth fishing, the water's cold, the fish are gonna be pretty lethargic, so we're gonna fish a subsurface fly and we're gonna to try to move the fly pretty slowly because the fish aren't gonna chase anything very far. Oh, nice smallmouth. So he was right in the back on the inside here in this kind of slow, swirly, slack water, the same kind of water we've been catching these guys with a slow retrieve in this cold water. So I'm using a seven weight rod, nine foot seven weight rod, and an intermediate line. Um, typically later in the season, you'd use a floating line for smallmouth, but we know the fish are gonna be relatively deep and the water isn't terribly deep here, but the fish are gonna be closer to the bottom. So an intermediate line should get me in the right place in conjunction with a weighted fly. I've got a weighted streamer fly on the end. Oh, that feels like a heavier fish. With the water this cold, I never would have thought we'd be catching small moss like this. Oh, that's a nice small moss too. That's a beauty. Nice fish. See you later. In spring, Concentrate on crayfish patterns and baitfish patterns between one and four inches long. Look for the prevailing baitfish sizes, shapes, and colors. They might be anything from a five inch gizzard shad in the south to inch long minnows in the north. In general, surface flies are not as effective at this time of year, although there can be exceptions. When we return, we'll look at the challenges of summer bass fishing. Summer is generally defined as water temperatures of 75 to 90 degrees. Bass change their habits and habitat during the summer, so you need to adjust how, where, and what you use for bass fishing. They change where they live, how they feed, and what they feed on when the water gets warmer. In summer, largemouth and smallmouth bass go to different places to feed, and you need to adjust your tactics accordingly. Oh, yeah! There we go. No. <laughs> in the salad, wow. It's going a long time, you know. Uh, fishing surface flies in the middle of summer for largemouth bass is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but we stuck at it and we finally got this nice bass out of this salad here. Go. He smashed it. Yeah, he inhaled that one. He wanted that little, uh, little diving frog. Get this out of him carefully if we can. Oh, oh beautiful. Right Came that, beautiful. out and then away he goes. 
So let's have a look at where to catch bass in rivers and lakes during the summer. So Adam, we're fishing a river today for largemouth. So we got current. Where do you look in a, in a river for largemouths? We're gonna look for some cover that's gonna break the current. Yep. Anything that those fish can get in behind so that they can still have food coming to them. So any kind of current breaks, like back, back eddies and back things like eddies, that? Back eddies, exactly. Uh -huh. Exact kind of thing that you would look for if you're trout fishing almost. Okay. Something to kind of break that current and they're gonna kind of sit in behind it and just ambush. Ambush bait. Okay. And you said the stronger the current, the deeper they're generally going to hold to get away from the current? So when the current is strong, they're going to actually, it's going to suck them to the bottom. Uh -huh. With less okay. current in, in the system, it'll, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll come up. Okay. And that's going to depend on the system that you're fishing now. So some systems will have a seven mile an hour current that might be strong for that system. That's going to suck those fish down. Yep. Whereas another system, three miles an hour might be a strong current. So three miles an hour will suck them down. Okay. So it's all depending on the system that you're fishing. Okay. In rivers, largemouth will seek slack water and heavy vegetation well away from the current. Generally, this will be in water less than 10 feet deep. Yeah, you know, it really helps to talk to a professional bass fisherman if you can, because they study bass. They know so much more scientifically and behaviorally about largemouth and smallmouth bass. And really, if you're gonna fly rod for bass, pay attention to the conventional fishermen. In summer, largemouth bass in both lakes and reservoirs will take residence in either heavy weed beds or move to deep water. They love heavy weed bed cover or even man-made structures like docks to hide from predators and feed. Weed beds, fallen trees, Another structure will hold schools of bait fish, which a largemouth key in on. In southern reservoirs, some largemouth bass will stay in deep water areas and hunt schooling bait fish, such as shad. You may need to use sonar to locate the bait fish, or you need to find out from local intelligence where bass and bait fish congregate during the summer. Bass can sometimes push bait fish to the surface, especially in late summer. Look for diving birds or swirls and splashes on the surface. This often happens early in the morning or late in the day. The fish. There we go. On the crayfish. Oh, oh that's a nice one. Yeah, Tom. not bad. <laughs> Probably the biggest largemouth I've caught in a while. <laughs> Come here, buddy. Nice fish. Mm. That's a good one. On the crayfish. Fish and poppers, and uh, the fish weren't cooperating, so we went deep with a crayfish, and uh, it was a nice bass. In rivers, smallmouth will move into faster water, but it'll use structures such as boulders and drop-offs and rock ledges for protection from the current and predators. Look for them in protected feeding lies near large rocks or logs. Much like trout in rivers, Smallmouth will move into less protected shallow water to seek out food such as mayflies, caddisflies, baitfish, and juvenile frogs. They do this mostly during periods of low light, like cloudy days or dawn and dusk. So this is summer fishing for smallmouths in a river. You never know where they're gonna be. We're in the deeper part of the river now, right where it enters a lake, and uh, you know we're trying all kinds of things. We didn't do anything on surface flies. Didn't see any surface activity. Went to a crayfish on an intermediate line and picked up this first bass. Crayfish is out. Smallmouth bass in lakes during the summer go to deeper water, but may transition to shallower water at different times of day based on conditions. Unlike largemouth bass, Smallmouth do not like water temperatures over 80 degrees and move into deeper water where it's cooler. Typically, they like rocky points, boulder fields, fallen timber, and other structures that'll hold prey. Most of us prefer to fish for them early and late in the day when they may move into shallow water to feed and to avoid predators like eagles and ospreys. Oh, yeah. So I kind of switched it up. I finally, finally stopped changing presentation because it just wasn't working. And this nice smallmouth 
took the nymph. Took that nymph deep too. Sucked it right in there. Yeah, just a little, just a little olive, kind of a nymph, nymphy crayfishy thing. Okay, buddy. Off you go. For summer largemouth, you'll want a floating line with a steep, heavy taper for throwing big wind-resistant flies. It should be an eight or nine weight. Your leader should be short, three to four feet, with a minimum of 20 pound test. Just a level piece of very heavy tippet will work fine, or you can make your own tapered leader. Cast will be short, and you'll need the heavy leader both to pull your fly out of the snags and to fight bass in this heavy cover. For casting into open water in summer, a seven or an eight weight rod is ideal. The flies are gonna be slightly smaller and you won't have to yank your flies out of heavy cover. What is key in summer is having a variety of fly lines to match the conditions. Floating lines work well for top water in early morning or in the evening, but during the heat of the day, you'll need sinking lines to get your flies down to the bass. You're not in the game for summer bass fishing in lakes unless you have sinking lines. For water that's up to eight feet deep, an intermediate line might be enough, but in deeper water, it's far more efficient to use a full sinking or depth charge line, something with a sink rate of between three to five inches per second. You'll want a four to six foot leader, typically just a straight section of 10 to 12 pound or OX to 2X tippet attached directly to your fly line with a perfection loop. So I'm gonna make a short leader for bass bugging. You don't need much. I'm gonna take a couple feet of 40 pound, then a piece of 35 pound, and then a piece of 25 pound. Just tie them together, make a leader about this long. So uh, I'm gonna take my, my heavy stuff, and you could go with a straight leader with with bass bugging, but this turns over a little bit better if you have some taper in it. So I'm just gonna take my 40 pound and tie a perfection loop in it. So now I've got my loop on the end of my leader. And then I'll take my 35 pound just a short piece of that to kind of transition. Tie that together with a triple surgeon's knot. Trim that. And that could be pretty short, just a transition. And then I'll put a piece of eh, 25 on the end. Large mouths are not, are not leader shy at all. 25 pound is, is nothing. It's actually pretty light for a large mouth and heavy cover. I'll tie that on. For my tippet. And that's it. A little bit longer than I thought, but uh, a good bass bug leader. Trim the ends, put it on our fly line, and we'll be all set. Thanks to the growing interest in fly fishing for largemouth and heavy cover, there are a great number of fly patterns available. Here are some of them. Frog patterns in deer hair work well, as do hard body plastic patterns. The key to remember in summer is that largemouth bass will often be in deeper water and not necessarily in heavy weed cover. For both smallmouth and largemouth bass in summer, whether in shallow or deep water, you'll need a variety of fly patterns in your fly box. For top water, hard body poppers are easy to cast and are very effective, especially in low light conditions. 
poppers with concave faces usually work best because of the sound and disturbance they make in the water. Yellow, orange, green, and black are all excellent choices. For bait fish patterns, you'll want to have a variety of both weighted and unweighted flies to help you efficiently probe all parts of the water column based on conditions. Baitfish streamers come in a wide variety of patterns and sizes to match your local bass forage. Check with your local fly shop or tackle store to find out what baitfish the bass are currently keyed in on. Of course, crayfish are a major staple of both types of bass. Ensure you have a variety of colors that are weighted in sizes from 1 to 4 inches in length. Bass love them fish slowly near the bottom. You may have to vary your retrieve based on the fly pattern and also match to the mood of the bass. Don't be afraid to experiment to find out how aggressive the bass are based on current conditions. Wow, he's got that fly down. Yeah. Well, they eat, they usually eat crayfish deep, I think, because they're worried about the claws. Uh, there we go. That was interesting. Adam spotted this bass just sitting out in the sun. Um, this is August, just sitting out in the sun. And um, we had a crayfish fly on, threw the crayfish to him, and Adam saw the fish come after the crayfish and boom, inhaled it right out here in the open. No cover, no nothing. All right, buddy. In the fall, when days get shorter and water temperatures drop below 70 degrees, this can really put bass on the move from deep into shallower water and they might feed aggressively. When water temperatures hover around 60 degrees, there's no reason to get up early or stay late. Bass will be most active in the middle of the day when water temperatures move into a more comfortable range for them. Yeah, now, painfully slow. Yes, yeah, it's fighting good. This this is a, a six-way rod. Very nice. Yeah, look at how wide the tail is, yeah. Very nice. Ultra, ultra slow. Okay. In the fall, both largemouth and smallmouth bass hunt in packs. Insects and frogs are not active, so these fish are prowling for schools of bait fish in both rivers and lakes. In lakes, the primary focus in the fall for both species is chasing large schools of baitfish in open water. They might push baitfish into the shallows, but they're just as likely to be in open water feeding on schools of suspended baitfish or pushing them to the surface. Look for fish around deep shoals or sunken humps where baitfish congregate. If you see diving birds or splashes, cast baitfish patterns right into the boils and retrieve with short, fast strips to imitate fleeing baitfish. You might be tempted to use a floating line, but it's much more effective to use a sinking line and begin your strips immediately because the predatory bass are typically in one to 13 feet of water. Get tight to the fly right away because bass may take the fly as soon as it lands. If you don't see any surface action, but spot baitfish schools on your sonar, a good technique is to drift over the baitfish schools and use a sinking or intermediate line. Let the fly sink and retrieve with short pulls with pauses in between. When you're fishing an intermediate or a sinking line especially, on a day like this where you got a little bit of wind, you want to keep that rod tip very close to the water. It's going to give you better line control. It's going to allow you to see or feel that strike if a fish takes it when the fly is dropping, and it just gives you a lot more control. In rivers in the fall, bass will move into the shallows again in search of bait fish. Bass will cruise in and out of the shallows, so cover the shallows and the deep edges nearby. A great technique to use in the fall in rivers is a full sinking line with a neutrally buoyant or floating streamer pattern like an unweighted muddler minnow or double D. 
The sinking line keeps the fly below the surface, but it rises above the bottom when you pause and keeps the fly from getting snagged. Ooh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, look at this. Oh, this is solid, solid fish. Oh, he's taking me down river. Look at that. Oh, yeah. He's one of those fish, he's so big, you can barely jump. <laughs> That's a big, solid fish. Look at that. How about that? A little bit of cabbage with it. Beautiful. I'd say that one's probably about three, three and a half. As we've said, you really need some sort of sinking line to effectively fish bass throughout the season. Let's go and talk to my friend Pete Kutzer about how to pick up and cast these kinds of lines. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about casting sinking lines and intermediate lines. Sinking lines and intermediate lines are great tools to use when those fish are down deep, but they have one big difference from your floating line, and that's that they sink. When they break the surface tension of the water and start to get below the surface, become very, very challenging to pick up off the water. So here's a couple tools or a couple tricks you can do to recast that sinking line or send it back out to those fish, making you a more effective angler. The first is stripping this line in. Once we make this cast out to that target, that line's gonna start to sink, getting down below the surface of the water. If I wait a few seconds, I can't pick this line up. What I wanna do is strip this line in and get to a manageable length, an easier length to pick up. And a lot of times that could be as little as 10 feet if it's a real heavy sinking line. The problem in doing that though, is it takes a little bit of time. I had to make a series of false casts, shooting a little bit of line each time. And in some situations when we're using sinking lines or intermediate lines, we got to get that fly there right away. A better tool to use, or a great tool to use, I should say, is the roll cast pickup. So the roll cast pickup is going to involve a good roll cast where we're going to get that rod across from our ear, come to a nice stop around eye level. Then we can pick it up and deliver that fly out to our target. But with this roll cast pickup, there's a couple things you have to keep in mind. The first thing is after we make that roll cast, we got to make sure that we get a good stop around eye level and that line straightens out. If we stop a little low on this roll cast, sometimes that line's going to pile up in the water and we might get a tangle. It's not going to get out there nice and straight. It's going to be challenging to pick that line back up. So for a good roll cast pickup, what we want to do is roll the line out as soon as it touches pick it right up, make that back cast forecast, and then we can deliver that fly back to the target. So again, I'm starting low. I bring that rod up across from my ear, come to a good stop around eye level, pick it right up, and now I can deliver it right back out to my target. And that's a completed roll cast pickup. It's a great tool in a lot of fishing situations, and it'll help you become a better angler. I think chasing bass with a fly rod is a great way to get introduced to fly fishing. Casts are short and easy, the fish don't mind the occasional sloppy delivery, and you can find them within a short drive almost anywhere in North America other than the very far north. And oh yeah, they're almost always willing to attack a fly, if you can find them. Guess so. <laughs> Fat. Wow, look wow. how fat that fish is. I told you there's fish in here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oop, fly popped out. That's good. And they got ourselves a bite top. Yeah. All right, we'll get him back in the water. You know, bass fishing is fun any time of year. Probably the best stuff is when you get them on top water in lily pads and you have those explosive strikes. But you can catch them any time of year. 
you need to modify your techniques, modify where you look for them, and you'll be able to catch largemouth and smallmouth almost any time of year. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. We wish you the very best of luck on the water. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Destination Ontario, Algoma Country, Main Office of Tourism, Adipose Boatworks, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. <laughs>